Okay. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our first session for our fall lecture series hosted by UCLA ASDA uh, pre dental Outreach. And um, today, we, we are very, very excited to host um, just the, the first session. And it's going to be about um, the PPID program and admissions. And so we have some special guests with us. So um, actually, I'll introduce myself. My name is Ethan. And um, one of the co-chairs for the, our pre-dental outreach committee, along with uh, Jackie here, and together we lead uh, the team. And today we have uh, Amna and Ishita speaking on behalf of, uh, as, as our guests. So I'll just pass the baton to you guys. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks everyone for being here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. And it would be nice to see all your faces <laughs> if you could turn your cameras on. Yes, just another um, note that we're not part of admissions. And so <laughs> you're more than welcome to ask any questions yeah. and be involved, um, be engaged. This is for you guys to um, get those extra questions answered. And um, yeah, we want to be of help to you. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we're good to go. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat, but uh, we'll also give some time at the end uh, for a quick Q&A and things like that. Um, all right, so let me present it. All right, so we're just gonna give a brief overview of um, our journey first. So I'll, I'll actually have Amna speak on this slide and, um, and then we'll go from there. Um, I don't think it shows my slide, but- Oh, really? Oh, okay, sorry. No? Oh, no, now it does. Okay, okay. Yeah. no, it's fine. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, my name is Amna. And I am originally from Pakistan, and I graduated in, from Dow University of Health Sciences in 2013. So yes, I've been in this game for a long time. Um, after graduating, I did practice uh, in private practice for a year and a half, and then I got married. And then, um, yeah, my husband uh, lived in Los Angeles, so I moved here. So, you know, aside from UCLA being uh, one of the top schools in the nation, I chose it because it was so close. Um, so yeah, that was one of the reasons and I'll get more into it later. So I'll give it to Ashita now. All right. Um, so hi guys, my name is Ishita and I actually graduated dental school from India in 2017. So it's been a while um, and then I moved to the U.S. the same year after graduating and I actually did a master's course which I'll talk a little bit about later. I did a master's in health informatics. That was a year program and then I worked for a year during that time in which I was applying to UCLA and other schools. Um, so I really used that time, um, those two years uh, in the U.S. to sort of beef up my profile a little bit. Um, so I did some research, I did volunteering, shadowing, things like that, and we'll go into detail. Um, yeah, so feel free to ask any questions about uh, my journey, and uh, let's go ahead and start uh, the presentation now. So uh, your profile doesn't have to look like Amna's or mine. It has to be your own personal story, your journey. So think of your profile as like a holistic view of who you are not just your scores, not just your TOEFL, your GPA, things like that. It has to be uh, the best representation of you. And they give a lot of opportunities for us to sort of shine and uh, rise above the competition. So the first thing that you need to know uh, to start an application is the CAPID application portal. So that's where your main application starts. It's a portal where you'll start to fill all your information and I'll send I'll um, have screenshots later in the slides, but it's a centralized application service for all internationally educated dentists who wish to practice dentistry in the US. Um, and they have a very nice website. Um, I've linked it over here, 
where uh, they have a guide on how you start your profile. You basically make an account and then you fill out all the uh, sections. So they have subsections for everything that you need, all the requirements, so everything's there. Um, and they also have this neat thing that for, for people who apply uh, multiple times, like in their second cycle, I got into UCLA in my second cycle. A lot of the information was transferred from my first application to my second application. Not all of it, but definitely some of it was transferred from the first to the second. So they're actually very, very helpful and a useful centralized service. Uh, so this is from one dental school to the next. So this is a brief overview of all the things that you will need to collect when you start uh, applying to a program. So of course you need your dental degree, then you need your transcript. So this is um, different from basically the marks card that you get, like we used to get a uh, marks card that was online, but you need to get a sealed uh, transcript that is basically issued from your main university and uh, it should be attested and sealed in a university envelope. So they'll seal it and put their stamp um, that basically says that it's authentic. And then you need your ECE report. So ECE report, for those who don't know, is a conversion of your um, international transcript to a US GPA system. Um, so the US GPA is uh, on four points. So usually it's like something out of four, or like it's a three out of four or 3.5 out of four. And that is usually not in any international schools. So um, this ECE, they help us to, you just basically put all your transmit, uh, transcripts over there and they will convert it into a US GPA and send over that grade to you. Um, so this is actually a very important part because I believe that you need this even to apply for the NBDE exam, which is the uh, board exam to even get, uh, to start your application. So these are the very first things that you need to even get started. So I would say start early because I know it takes time to collect all these things, especially if you're already in the US and um, you graduated from a different country, it's difficult to sort of coordinate with your international university to send you the transcript and things like that. It can take a lot of time. So I do stress on the fact that start early. Most application deadlines are starting summer of every year. I think it's, I believe it's May, June, July. So start six months in advance. Even the earlier you start, the better it is. Because it takes time to reach out to professors. It, it takes time to reach out to university administrators so that they can put your transcript and seal it for you. Um, okay. So, and then we have standardized testing. Once you have all of these things and you've applied, you got your GPA and everything, and then you apply for your NBDE exams. Now, uh, when Amna and I took these, it was in two different parts. It was the NBD part one and part two. Uh, but now it's an integrated NBD, so it's only one exam. So a good thing is you only have to pay the fee once and you only have to go to the test center once, but um, you do have to study everything together. So for us, part one, it was just um, your first year and second year subject. So it was um, dental anatomy, physiology, uh, I think biochemistry, things like that. and Part two NBD was all uh, your final year subjects like uh, PROS, ENDO, things like that. But so INBD will be a combination of the two. So it's gonna be a lot of studying, but uh, it's good that it's only one exam. Um, now I do get a frequent question that what if uh, I have already taken part one and part two and I have not applied yet? Um, what if I haven't taken the INBD? Do I have to take the INBD again? But I believe that the part one and part two are still valid. So even if you took the exams and now they've just changed the system, you should be able to submit those part one and part two scores and it'll still be valid. So you don't have to retake the INBD. And then of course there's TOEFL. Um, even if your um, schooling was completely in the English language, just the fact that you did dental school in an international um, institute uh, so that's a requirement for all international students, regardless of which language your um, dental education was in. So for me, like my dental education was fully in English, but still I had to take the TOEFL to um, qualify as an applicant. So the TOEFL is an English language test. It's actually one of the uh, easier tests as compared to the other ones that I've listed over here. Uh, and then there's the ADATS. So the ADATS is an advanced dental admission test. I think that's the acronym, but 
Um, I personally didn't take this test because it's not a necessary thing for you to have. I think it's only one school uh, that makes it compulsory for you to have it. But other than that, 90% of the schools in the US, at least for the DDS admission, don't require the ADAT. But if you really, really want to spruce up your profile, um, a lot of schools consider it. Um, so if you want to take it, you can. I know that it's not a pass fail like MBDE. I think you need to get a particular score and that determines your sort of standing. Um, I personally didn't take it, but um, if you, if, if the option is there for you if you do want to. Um, another helpful tip is that ADEA website, they have a whole directory of schools, um, and I can show that to you later, um, where they've mentioned uh, which schools even consider the ADAT and which schools don't even look at the score. Uh, for you to see that. So if you're very sure that these are the schools you want to apply to and they don't really take the ADAT, so there's really no need for you to um, take that one extra exam. But the NBD and the TOEFL are compulsory and 100% required for all schools. And then lastly, the SOP and CV, even though it's last, it's definitely not the least. And I'll talk about this very much in detail uh, because these are very, very, very important parts of your profile. Uh, because up until now, um, the standardized testing, everyone's application is going to look the same. Everyone's going to have a good GPA. Everyone's going to have um, your uh, testing. A lot of people are going to have a good GPA. Everyone's going to have these test scores. So it's going to look pretty much the same. But what will make you stand out and make you look different are your SOB and CV. So you are completely in control of these two things. So that's why I'll um, stress a lot about these things later in the later slides. All right, so this is that Capert portal that I was talking about. Um, so this is where your application is going to be breathed into life. So basically this is where you will make an account and you'll put your personal information in. Uh, this will be your citizenship, your uh, country of birth, date of birth, things like that. Then your academic history, um, your education, if you did a master's degree, if you did a master's degree in dentistry, all of the degrees that you have, um, and then your supporting information and any program materials. So when you start adding a program, uh, they will have their own separate requirements that are outside of this CAPID portal. So a lot of universities, most universities will have a supplemental application where they might have questions on their own or they'll require you to add uh, more documents that are specific to that university. So again, that's very important. But this is what your application will look like. And you can add any program from here. When you go to add program, all the listed programs that are valid will be there. And then you can submit it. All right, um, so this is that supporting information tab. And this is where most of um, your profile is going to be. So let's start with evaluations. And I do get a lot of questions about this. Um, so the evaluation is like a letter of recommendation um, that every school requires. I think most schools have a minimum of three requirement and some have even five. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. So you have to create this evaluation request and send it to whoever you would like to provide a letter on your behalf. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about this before I show you how it's done. So that's a letter of recommendation or a letter of reference. Who you can go to, you can go, I think a lot of schools have the requirement that one of the letters has to be from the Dean of the Dental College that you graduated from. The second can be any faculty who knows you really well in dental college. And the third one can be anyone. Uh, preferably, this should be from a dentist or a professor in the US. If you've done a master's in the US, um, and some people do, uh, if you could get a letter from anyone in the US, that holds a lot of meaning over another letter from uh, wherever you've graduated from. The letters, of course, should be on of the official school letterhead. They should be signed, dated, and there should be an official seal. It will be uploaded directly to CAPIT by the evaluator. So this is what I was talking about in the last slide. You will create an evaluation request. You will add uh, that person's uh, information and email. 
address and that request will directly go to their email address and they will have the option to upload it using their email address. So you are personally not involved in uploading the letter. Obviously they want to maintain confidentiality. That's why they will directly request the, um, the person who will be sending, uh, who will be writing a letter on your behalf. Okay. And uh, although uh, they will need a soft copy for that, but I do recommend keep sealed hard copies of the letters uh, because you will need it later. Remember when I said that there will be supplemental application materials that every program requires. So some programs do require a hard copy of letter that you mail in person. So um, it's very helpful to while you're requesting this letter, um, it's very helpful for ha to have them print it out and seal it in, in an envelope. So get three or four copies at least because you'll need it later. All right, and now we go to our statement of purpose or uh, our personal statement. And I cannot stress how important this part of uh, the application is. Again, this is one of those uh, things that is fully in your control. And this will really, really help um, paint a picture of who you are as an applicant to the admissions committee. So by this point, they're, um, they're just looking at hundreds and thousands of applications. And um, of course, they're seeing the TOEFL score, they're seeing NDB, but this is where um, they'll see something different, right? Because everyone's essay is going to be slightly different. So this is where you can really use your writing skills um, to enhance your application. And a lot of us, at least like where, from where I'm from, we don't, we're not really used to writing an essay about ourselves. So this was, I think, a very challenging part for me as part of the application. So I spent a lot of time on it. Um, and in my first application cycle, I admittedly did not spend so much time on it and I didn't get that many interviews. But on my second cycle, when I consulted with people, they said this is really one of the most important parts of your application. So I spent a lot more time uh, on it, as almost like a month editing it, re-editing it. I had my friends read it. I um, and I just kept editing it until I was fully satisfied with it. That actually took me a full month, and I got a lot more interviews. So. Um, even though my other application things hadn't changed that much, but I really, really focused on my personal statement. And I, I really do believe that that's what got me noticed the second time around. Um, so uh, tips on personal statement writing. It's like writing a story about yourself. Uh, it's not, don't state any facts about yourself. The biggest uh, flaw that I see in the personal statement that I read is that it's like, um, a version of their CV. Like, oh, I went to school here, or I did this job here, I got this award here. They really don't want to see that. Um, that should be in your CV. Highlight your awards and everything, your experiences in your CV. Your personal statement should be, how did that make you feel? Like, why do you like dentistry? Or why, um, what part of dentistry made you want to come to the US? Why do you want to come to the US? And things like that. So. Um, and I, this is actually really nicely broken down here. So in the introduction, this is not your self-introduction. So you don't start your personal statement be like, oh, this is my name, this, I'm applying to this. They already know that. The, this introduction is um, an introduction to your story, why dentistry interested you. So write how and why that field interests you. So for example, I know a lot of personal statements begin with, oh, I, I've always, been in love with dentistry because I had, uh, had braces as a kid and that's why they fixed it. And so a lot of stories start like that. Um, and what, uh, what do you aspire to do in this domain? Why you've always loved dentistry and what do you see yourself as? Um, and then your background, you can go a little bit into the academic information of your school or college, not too much. It shouldn't be a statement of facts. Um, and then any professional experience and a lot of people do write stories. So they'll write uh, stories of how once they treated a patient and how that made them feel, um, things like that. So they really want to know you as a person. Then why uh, an international dental degree? Now that you've already had a dental degree in your country, why do you need another uh, dental degree? Why do you want to come to the US? 
things like that. They want to know the why and how of everything rather than just a statement of facts. Um, again, clearly specify your goal immediately, portray your long-term plans. They want to see a serious candidate, right? Um, and then of course, a little bit about why this university. So this is not entirely possible when you're uh, submitting your personal statement on CAPID because it's going to go to all the schools, but there is going to be supplemental questions uh, in other program materials where they will ask you, oh, why UCLA or why UCSF? That's where you can really highlight that, oh, the UCLA mission statement is this and that really aligns with my goals, things like that. Um, and then in a summary, in conclusion, you can sum up what you've written. And again, it shouldn't be um, a statement of your facts or anything like that. It should be very customized to your personal story. Um, and again, it shouldn't be very long because again, they, they go through thousands and thousands of applications. So it's very important that you keep it concise. So I would say one to two pages. And again, it should flow like a story, like almost as if they're reading a novel of why, um, or an autobiography of why you chose dentistry in the first place and what made you come here and what you plan to do ahead. Um, so I hope that makes sense and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about this because again, I can't stress how important this is. Um, all right, so next thing. So now, uh, talking a little bit about the INBD exam, this will be one of the first things you even do before you even start your CAPID application because um, you need it as a, as a thing to even qualify to apply. So this is one thing you have to have before you can even think of starting your application. Um, so these are some of the sources that I used to study the first aid for NBD ebook. Uh, then I did a lot of dental decks. I get this question a lot, um, the sources that I read. And I haven't listed a lot of them because a lot of people, what they do is um, they'll read uh, like uh, 10 books, but they won't retain a lot of information. So I would suggest that stick to uh, one or two books uh, because they essentially all have the same information, but do them really well, rather than uh, focusing on a quantity of study materials, focus on the quality. Um, so I did the first aid, I did the dental deck, and I did a lot of previous year's papers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Again, now this is um, actually a very, very helpful part that I, I personally think that I passed the NBD because I joined uh, these Facebook groups. Uh, you'll find them a lot. So you can just type like the CAPID um, on the Facebook search and type the year of application and you'll find many groups where a lot of people are applying and preparing with you. So just having that community helped me a lot, uh, especially in stressful times, just before an exam, because every day they would post a question and then a lot of people would discuss it. And while you're going through social media, it sort of cemented that question and answer uh, in front of me. So that was very, very helpful for me. So join as many Facebook pages as you can. Oh, and you feel like you meet like-minded people who are sort of going through the same journey with you. So it's very helpful to uh, see things from their perspective as well. Um, and then especially that subjects that um, you're ha having a little bit of trouble with, you can post a question and people will be able to answer. So a lot of them also uh, post uh, previous year papers from ASDA that are released by ASDA. So you can actually get that information from there too. So I really use those uh, Facebook pages as a source of, as like another source of study material. I know that we don't really use uh, social media as study, but <laughs> I actually did and really helped me a lot. Okay, um, so these are just some tips and tricks. You don't necessarily have to follow them, but this is something that helped me out. Uh, start with the easier subjects, that way you sort of build your confidence before uh, you go on to the tough ones. And I know what's easy for me may not be easy for you, what's easy for you may not be easy for me. So you really know your strengths and weaknesses. So I would say customize your study plan according to your uh, strengths and weaknesses. Like I know I'm not really that that good at human anatomy, that's beyond the head and neck. So I, I kept that towards the end. Um, and then, and again, uh, don't acquire too many resources, um, just stick to the ones that you like and then do them really well. Uh, try to get the most updated study materials, although those are, those are a little more expensive than um, let's say the first date from 2013 and 2014, but try to get the most updated study materials. 
upperclassmen are your friends. Of course, if you have um, seniors on your in your college that have had um, have done this and they probably have older books, of course, they are your best friends. Um, and as it gets closer to test day, uh, take practice exams. I, I'm not sure if there are full online practice exams of MBD available, but I did uh, refer to the previous year papers. Again, I found them on the Facebook page. Uh, there's a file section in every Facebook group and everyone sort of uploads their study materials there. So I got a lot of previous year questions and papers from there. And some of those questions actually did end up on my actual test. So that really helped me out. All right, and this is the TOEFL exam. So some TOEFL tips and tricks. Uh, for those who may not be aware, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself if you already know this, but the TOEFL is an English language test and it's uh, testing your proficiency in the English language. So it's nothing fancy. Um, I believe that this was one of the easier tests that I've taken. Um, so just, you need a little bit time to prepare. So set aside some time. I know you're, you're usually very focused on dentistry and NVD and things like that, but just set, set aside some time in your application cycle just to take the TOEFL and be done with it. Again, personalize your study plan, identify strengths and weaknesses. There are usually four sections, listening, speaking, writing, and um, reading. Um, so identify your strengths and weaknesses. If you have a little bit of trouble speaking, uh, start speaking to people in English, even in your day-to-day -day conversation. Um, that really helps out. Uh, again, join social media groups. Uh, there'll be a lot of, I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot of social media groups that are the TOEFL, 2021 or something like that. I'm sure you'll find so many, just connect with fellow exam takers. They might even have better information than me and I'm not my child because it's been a while since we've taken these exams. So it's really helpful to be connected to people who are going through the same journey with you um, in this time. Utilize high quality study materials. So ETS is the official examination um, administrator of the TOEFL. So they have some study materials on their website. And they have some free practice tests as well. So I would highly, highly recommend checking them out. Um, and I can add their information on the chat later. And then Noteful is a free online uh, source for TOEFL. I personally use their resources and I, I, it was more than enough for me uh, for prepar in terms of preparation. And I know that Kaplan has some paid courses that you can take. It's really up to you. There's a number of sources available to study for TOEFL. Um, but I do recommend using some high quality materials. And very importantly, please take as many practice tests as you can. Some people even said to me that take seven practice tests before the day, one each day of the, before the week that you're going to take the test. Because that will really, really set um, your expectation and you'll know um, what, uh, why, what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and there are many free practice tests available online. ETS themselves, I think, have two. And then um, you can just type TOEFL practice tests and you'll have so many free practice tests available. So I do recommend taking those tests, especially just before your exam. And one day before test day, don't go crazy. It's a very long exam. I remember it being super long because there are four long, long sections. So try to get a good sleep. You need a lot of energy for the exam and just relax um, because this is an exam you can take over and over again until you're absolutely satisfied with it. Of course, it does come with its expenses, but you don't have to think of it as something that's do or die. So there's always another chance. So just um, get a good sleep and relax the day before the exam. It really helped me out. All right, so there are some minimum requirements for TOEFL scores, at least for UCLA there are. Um, Minimum is usually a hundred, but I do recommend aiming for something that's even higher because um, the competition is fierce. I, I don't have to tell you that, I'm sure you guys know. Uh, there are thousands of applications in there and in most schools there are about 20 to 25 seats. So um, the competition is fierce and TOEFL is a relatively easier exam to get a high score in. Um, so I would recommend aiming for a higher score than requirement. Um, so even taking it twice if you like just to set yourself apart a little from the competition. So these are the UCLA requirements. They require a minimum writing score of 25, speaking 24, and this is all out of 30. 
reading of 21 and listening of 17. So the TOEFL, total TOEFL score report should be 95 or higher. But again, I do recommend aiming for something like 110 to be a really serious applicant because a lot of people get good scores on TOEFL. So um, having a score less than 95 or even less than 100 um, sets you apart a little, sets you a little behind than the rest of the applicants. All right, and now I'll hand it over to my wonderful colleague, Amna, and she'll talk about CV and resume. Thank you so much, Ashita. That was like great uh, detailed information. I, um, so CV is obviously very important as well, but as Ishita said that this is where you will state uh, the facts basically, and this is not the time to write the stories. That's, that's what you did in the, um, the personal statement. So CV has to be like very concise. Um, um, you're not going to write too much. Okay. No one wants to read like three pages of CV, right? Or resume. They don't want to read so much. They don't have time for that. So make sure that you have all the information there, but it has to be like concise and also very organized. Um, so also I want to, um, uh, you know, let you guys know that some schools basically have their own template. So I remember that um, UOP, um, Nevada, they had their own templates and you had to like follow exactly like what they want. Um, and even if you make a mistake, they would actually email you back saying that, okay, you missed on this or that. So so make sure that, you know, when um, you are actually making the resume, make sure that if you're applying to a certain school, if they have any requirements, follow it to the T. Um, for my CV, um, basically for UCLA, they didn't really have any template as such, but I kind of divided it um, in a very organized manner so I can share what I had. So I started with the objective and then I had my education, which was in the chronological order. Uh, and then I had my experiences. So I divided that into three, which was dental. Um, then it was research and non-dental. You don't have to do that, but I just did it like that. I wanted it to be like, you know, separated from each other so that it's, you know, highlighted in that way. And then I had my, after my experiences, I had my continuing education and achievements. And yeah, so basically in that order, I was able to um, make my CV in that way and uh, it kind of worked. Uh, but uh, yeah, these, these are some of the headings that you should have, um, like your, as I mentioned, education, your experience, volunteering, um, any leadership, or if you have, um, you know, research papers uh, published and any awards and honors. So make sure that you do mention um, if you have any of those. Next. So yeah, this is basically a repetition of what I said. Just make sure that your CV is not too long. Um, uh, limit the length to one to two pages and uh, make sure that everything that you've listed is in a chronological order. Um, again, tips for better CV. By that, we mean that, for example, if you have something in your profile that is like slightly on the negative side. For example, uh, you have a GPA that's like on a lower side. So you can balance it out by building your CV. So how do you build your CV? You can do continuing education courses. Um, you can do preceptorship. Um, you can, um, can you go back, Ishita? One slide. Yeah. So if you have uh, if you have a chance, I mean, not it's not that easy, but if you can get into research um, that can also build your resume. And um, yeah, basically, these are some of the things that you can kind of balance. If you have something negative, you can kind of like balance it out with more stuff. Um, and because, again, it's very, very um, important for you to know that applications are viewed holistically, like Ishita said. Um, it's, they're not going to just focus like on GPA or like a TOEFL score. It's going to be like all over. And um, yeah, basically what connects everything is the personal statement. So make sure that you have that in mind. Next. Um, so GPA above three is considered reasonable to be uh, to be able to apply for advanced learning programs, but don't be discouraged if you have less than three, because I know some people who have less than three and they did get into 
programs. So um, then again, you know, as I said, if you have something on the lower side, you want to balance it out with other things. So it just shows that, you know, you're so eager to improve and um, yeah, basically, as it stays here, that like maybe you can do a master's or you can, you know, get into a preceptorship or research or try to do something that will enhance your profile. And then again, you can mention it always in your personal statement. Like, um, for example, if you were, you know, you have a GPA that's on the lower side, you can always explain what happened and how you, you know, came stronger from it. Like, how do you bounce back from it and how you're ready to, you know, take more challenges. So that's where you can, you know, explain yourself a little bit, but don't be disappointed that if you have less than three, um, yeah, definitely there are people out there who are, um, going, they did get admissions um, below three. So don't be discouraged. Next. So yeah, again, um, uh, as I mentioned, this are, these are some of the ways that you can build your um, resume. One of them is doing, um, you know, CE courses. So these are some of the um, sources that you can use. Personally, I um, I did um, quite a lot of CE courses. Um, I also took some at UCLA. Um, obviously because it was close to me and they do offer a lot of good, um, um, you know, CE courses, hands-on. Um, they are, obviously you have to pay for it, but I guess that's really worth it. And, um, you know, one of my, um, the top choices in dental schools was UCLA. So I also wanted to show like I, my, you know, eagerness to be affiliated with UCLA. So I, did a bunch of um, those CE courses there. Um, you can actually find them on their website. I can link them later on in the chat. Um, also, you can, uh, another way to do CEs is, uh, you know, convention. So as we have mentioned in this slide, ADA, CDA. So um, I did uh, CDA, I went to the CDA convention. It was like a two day, or I think it was three days. So um, you can go and get, uh, bunch of CEs there. So, and it's really helpful. Um, I think that was, uh, that was a great experience. Um, so if you're in California, um, they do do it every year. Um, I think this year it was virtual, but uh, maybe next year, hopefully they will have it in person. Um, so yeah, do look out for that as well. And then um, again, if you are in the US, please, uh, do some kind of a you know clinical experience so that you can show that you are you know you worked obviously in your home country but you're also uh doing something here so obviously we don't we're not licensed to practice as dentists but there's many other things that you can do um so for example it could be dental assisting um uh you can do shadow like shadowing a dentist or or better dental assisting is better than shadowing, but anything is better than nothing, right? Um, preceptorship, as I've mentioned, uh, there are some schools that have preceptorship programs. They are available on their, uh, information is available on their websites. Um, UCLA does have a preceptorship program. So if you want, if you are interested, you can go to their website and find out about that. Um, other than, um, you know, dental, you can always indulge in non-dental uh, volunteering. Like myself, I did the American Red Cross um, it was like a, a sort of like a blood donor um, ambassador position where I was involved in, you know, helping people who were coming in for um, donating blood. So anything counts. Basically, they want to be able to see how you are um, in this type of a field, how are you, how you are with your volunteering and how you are and all that. So, yeah, just be busy. Um, that's what they want to see. If if you are here, they don't want to see that, oh, you just came and you just started applying to schools. Um, you can get lucky like that, but I feel that what they're looking for is how eager you are to get involved, right? Um, be it dental or non-dental, but they want to see that you've been busy working towards this. So yes, do... Um, anything that you can. And also this is a very good opportunity. Uh, CDA Cares, if you're in California um, and Care Harbor, these are basically um, like uh, dental camps. 
where you can work as a uh, dental assistant and um, it really helps to boost up your resume. So yeah, these are some of the things that you can do. And then as I mentioned, um, research is also a good way um, to boost up your um, resume. Um, so how do you get involved in research? Um, it seems like it's impossible, um, especially if you're in US, uh, but trust me, it's not. Um, I was uh, I was able to get uh, a little bit of a research experience at UCLA, so I kind of like reached out to professors who are basically um, here at UCLA, and I emailed uh, like quite a lot of them, and um, I didn't really get a good response, but two people did get back to me, and uh, one of them asked me to come and you know visit the lab and everything, and. Um, I was able to kind of get involved in research like that and that too at UCLA. So, you know, it's, if you have a will, there's always a way to get into it. And um, so how important is research experience? I mean, it kind of just shows you how versatile you can be. I mean, you're a dentist. Why should I, you know, you're, you're probably thinking, why should I do research when I'm a dentist, right? But as you know, like dentistry is always backed by research. So if you want to get involved in behind the scenes, it's always good. And uh, I personally did it because I wanted to show that, you know, I'm, um, I'm versatile and I can do almost anything related to dentistry, be it research, be it practice. So yes, it does help. And um, also UCLA is basically um, a research-based school. So that also, I, that was one of the reasons why I also wanted to get into research. Next. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'll get back to you with that question. Um, so fresh graduates, do I have a chance? Um, definitely you do. Um, and then opposite of that would also be true if you are someone who are, who's not a fresh graduate like me. Um, and to be honest, like, I always used to hear that, oh, UCLA does not, uh, you know, they don't accept um, older graduates and you know I always thought that okay maybe I don't have a chance here <laughs> but I am here so I busted that myth and you know either ways you can do it you just have to follow what uh, you know Ishita and I've been talking about how to build your resume personal statement all of it is going to be you know holistically looked at so uh, don't worry if you're a fresh graduate or not Um, so I can just on, on a, you know, superficially, I can say that related to visas, uh, I'm not that of an expert, maybe Ishita can chime in, but yes, here, um, I mean, it's, it's different for different schools, but for UCLA, they don't prefer, um, you to be a citizen or a green card holder. You can obviously be on a visa and you can still get in. But Ishita, if you want to add something to that, uh, you are more than welcome to add that. Sorry, <laughs> I was on mute. Uh, yeah, so um, there are some schools that definitely prefer green card holders and citizens. So again, for that, that um, idea directory is very, very helpful. And I'll add it in the chat. Um, that's what I was trying to do. And that's why I clicked out of it. But um, <laughs> So uh, they have linked all the schools that definitely prefer US citizens and green card holders, but there are a lot of schools uh, that accept um, F1 visas that are like student visas and even uh, an H4 visa, which is a spouse of a work visa. So does UCLA prefer citizens or visa applicants? No, we are, I think half of us here are uh, visa holders, yeah. the other half are citizens. And I do get this question a lot that um, you came to the tourist on a separate visa, but because you wanted to take your MBD exam and then you just wanted to get it uh, transferred, you can do that. Um, another question I get is I came to the US on a student visa for another school because you were doing a master's or a preceptorship or something like that. You can also get that student visa transferred to the UCLA or, or whichever school you would like um, to a DDS student visa. So I can, I'm happy to answer any visa related questions um, after I'm that's done. <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, I mean, um, obviously you can find that information as uh, Ishita said on the ADEA or 
uh, the school also has um, that available on their website. So just make sure that you look at that and, you know, it's not worth probably applying to a school that has specifically said that we prefer citizens and if you're not a citizen, so yeah. Um, but yes, UCLA, they accept all kinds of uh, students. So next slide. Okay, yeah, money matters, right? Um, so I did uh, update most of these prices right now. Um, one good news is that, um, sorry, I was not, I did not edit the NBD. It's INBD now and it's 680, which is better because it was divided into two parts and you had to pay two separate fees. But if you are traveling to, um, you know, a certain location, where so the travel cost and the stay obviously you have to include that but the INBDE is 680 and then as Ishita mentioned that we have to get the ECE that report is course by course is what most of the schools require so that is 195 and you can obviously go into the website and just verify all of these so I have this a little as a just a guide for you to think about your finances uh, when you're getting into it um but yeah, and, and then if you decide to do a bench test uh, preparatory course, that can be expensive, but there are, you know, they range from like a one day course or two day course to even like 12 day course. So obviously the fees is going to vary according to that. Um, and yeah, if you're looking to get into preceptorship that also comes with a fee um, and um, the tuition fee is the, the biggest chunk uh, so it also varies, obviously, from school to school. Um, but yes, uh, just plan ahead. Um, yeah, so see, there's just a little bit of uh, some tips uh, that you don't want to have a long gap period in between what you're doing. Um, personally, uh, when I came to US, I did not do anything for the first eight months. Um, I had recently gotten married, so I was in my honeymoon phase, but, you know, I really caught on to it and I went head over heels trying to build my resume from that point onwards. And uh, I did kind of mention that in my personal statement as well. So don't be afraid to like be honest. Yeah, it's, it's you, right? It's, that's what happened. And then um, you have to, yeah, just don't be robotic. You have to have a very personalized um you know application everyone has different experiences and you want that to shine right so just make your application interesting don't be like afraid to um you know think out of the box and um again yeah show every aspect of yourself in a proper amount and present um, in your application how uh you developed in dentistry um so yeah basically not only that's not only going to be reflected in your CV, but you have to back it up with your personal statement. Oh. And again, these are some of the qualities that they're looking for. I, um, you know, I, I'm sure all of you know all of these, so I'm not going to go into this <laughs> specifically. But then again, um, you need to keep in mind that the experience that you have. Um, in the States weighs more than the experience that you have abroad. Um, obviously you got your dental degree from abroad, but if you have work experience there, that does count. I'm not, I'm not saying it does not, but if you have experience here working in the dental field, that is the gold, okay? That means that you have exposure. You are kind of familiar with how dentistry is here. You are familiar with dealing with patients here. So I did work as a chairside dental assistant um, for two years before I even, you know, started dentistry here, uh, dental school here. So that basically um, helped a lot, actually. And then hands-on is obviously more important than online. What it means is the CEs that you're taking. So the, I'm sure that you're tempted to take a lot of, um, you know, CEs that are free online. You can do that. But... Um, it will be better if you can have more hands-on experience. Um, and then um, masters is better than courses. I mean, to be honest, um, yes, having another degree will help you a lot, but don't be discouraged if you don't have it. Um, 
it's totally fine. But you just have to remember that you have to balance it out from other things. So yeah, that's that's um, my tip for you guys. You don't have to go ahead and do masters in order to be more competitive, but um, they will look everything holistically again. And then, um, so yeah, basically um, make sure that um, each school has their own website. And um, if, when you apply, um, they will give you like, when they send you, um, when you're like, basically applying for a school, they will send out a requirement that they actually have specific to them. So do pay attention to that, okay? Um, and all, most of, sometimes most of the information is available online as well. So um, they are stated by every school on their website and also through the CAPIT portal, as Ishita was saying, that there is supplemental um, information required from each school sometimes. So make sure to read through that and don't skip anything. Okay, so this is um, one of the screenshots from the portal. Um, so what type of experiences, it's kind of like a repetition, you are going to write it in your CV, but you know, you have to add everything on Cabot as well. So in this, uh, you can write about your dental related, your non-dental, your if you were teaching somewhere, um, research, volunteer activities. So every tab has different, um, you know, you can have a different um, point to that. And then I guess these are the achievements. If you have any awards or publications or presentation, poster presentation, that will go in here. And I believe in licenses, you can post, uh, oh, sorry. But there is a licensing tab and then you can put your dental license or something like that in there. Um, what else? Okay, and they have another tab. If something that doesn't you know, fit in the category that you had before, uh, have you seen before, you can always write extra stuff here. Um, so, you know, if you have any other talents or interests and hobbies, you can write that. And it's okay if you don't have anything extra to add, just, you know, don't worry about it. But they gave you something to, if you want to add to it, they gave you this tab. And then this is basically how um, Ishita was showing earlier, how you can add programs. So this is how it's going to look like. Um, yeah, pretty much self-explanatory. And yeah, basically when um, you do get uh, interview calls, hopefully you all will do that. Um, just again, my tip is not to be robotic or trying to be someone else. Just be natural and, you know, just be, just know your application very well. Um, uh, you know, sometimes when you're nervous, sometimes you, you can, you know, miss out a, a detail. So it's very important that, you go through your application multiple times before the day of your interview so that you know you don't mess up anything. And yeah, the most important thing is to be yourself. Um, you don't want to look like someone else. Okay, so there are bench tests. Um, some schools do have bench tests and most of the common exercises are like a crown prep or a cavity prep. Um, so yeah, uh, now UCLA does not have a bench test. Um, they have an interview and sort of like an OSCE um, situation. So they don't even have this anymore. It's obviously after COVID, there are some changes, but yeah, most, most schools uh, used to ask all these stuff, some common exercises. I believe Ishita, some schools are still doing bench tests, right? Uh, yeah, some schools are still doing, I'm not sure if they're in person, uh, but this is mostly because of COVID. But I do I do think that after things settle down, they're still going to have in-person bench courses. And, yeah. uh, and definitely some of them are more extensive than others. Like UCLA especially has um, had us do a NBD type or part one type exam, which was multiple choice. And we had an OSCE like Amna mentioned. And then we had also a class two cavity preparation. But I know that yeah. USC has um, your uh, wax carving that they can give any object for you to wax carve out of wax. And then I know that University of Washington had a, um, they endo. would do a, yeah, endo or, or they would ask you to make an art design, things like that. So it's, yeah, uh, it varies. Yeah, but this was very 
uh, and it was before COVID, a lot of schools have changed their bench test um, uh, settings, but I'm pretty sure that they will update their websites as they go. Um, most schools also have information about what the bench test looks like. Again, this is again where your Facebook groups are very <laughs> important yeah. because people often post that, oh, I just got an interview and the bench test says that we have to do this. So um, again, that's very important because that will be give you the most current um, information that there is. Correct. That's all folks. Um, I believe there was a question related to something. Oh, you already answered that, huh? Yeah, the emails. Yeah, you already answered. Any other questions? Let me click out of this. Like Ethan mentioned, we're really not the admissions committee, so. <laughs> yeah, feel free to mute or you can personal message one of the four of us or just put it in the chat. Either way works. My goodness, this was so informative. I'm so impressed, but I'll let you continue. <laughs> Someone Hi. raised a hand. Hi, my name is Utsavi and I do have a question. Uh, so I know like, you know, everyone's profile is different and everyone goes through the different things, but <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I am a re-applicant. So, you know, like any tips or advice that, you know, that I should specifically focus on. And again, I'm trying to involve myself with uh, uh, dentistry, uh, you know, doing uh, several things as much as I can, but uh, I think at this point, I'm kind of lost that, okay, what is admission committee that, uh, you know, looking for, I'm doing like some thousand different things, but still it's not working out. So it's kind of a little bit of frustration and also, uh, you know, I'm kind of lost. So if you guys have any tips on that, that's, I would really appreciate that. Um, I, I actually was a reapplicant and, um, Basically, I, I thought that I had it all <laughs> when I applied the first time, um, but uh, I did not maybe like, you know, I was lacking somewhere on my personal statement or somewhere or the other, um, but I feel like majority of it was, um, I think um, I was working as a dental assistant when I applied for the first time, but then after that, I was like, okay, wait, I maybe need to like show them that I am very versatile, I can do more stuff. So I started doing volunteering, community services. I did the research that I mentioned um, and, and I did a lot of CEs, yeah. So that was a big difference from, you know, what I did in the first cycle as compared to the second one. So I, I think that's what they, sh they saw that I was not just sitting idle Think, you know waiting for the next cycle I kind of improved myself um, and yeah I was persistent so I think that's the key the persistence is the key if you're doing too many things and it doesn't make sense then I don't think that's not gonna look good you you know like as we say quality over quantity so choose wisely and it's it, it will work out just be persistent and Ishita obviously you can um, also share your uh, experience um, so I'm also a reapplicant, re um, and I, I second, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that Amna said. Like they want to see persistence. They they don't want to see you give up. They want they actually value people who stick to their guns even though they're rejected. It's it's basic. It's a little cheesy, but it's about how you stand up after you fall down, right? Um, yeah. So they want to see that. Me personally, again, um, I really, really focused on my personal statement in the second round. Um, and of course I did add a couple of volunteering because I had that one year to recoup. Um, I added a volunteering, shadowing, more opportunities, but I think the personal statement was the main major change uh, that I made from the first cycle to the second cycle. I actually got a little professional help, uh, not for someone to write it for me. I know that uh, when you join these Facebook groups, just a point that there are people who will offer to write it for you. Please, please, please do not do that um, because uh, they don't know you uh, like you do. So um, admissions committees can spot a fake story like very fast. 
So, yeah. but I did actually get some professional help as an editor. So someone just reviewed my resume, uh, my uh, personal statement and they offered to um, help me edit it. Um, so that really helped out, helped me out because English is not my first language. So there were some things that I wanted to say, but I didn't know how to say them very well so that it would come across to the admissions committee. Um, so I had an editor sort of help me rephrase some of the sentences. Um, so that really helped me out because I, I read my uh, original personal statement and the edited one that I had, had help with and it looked very different, even though I'm saying the same thing, but it, I'm saying it in so much, in such a better way that my story came across very nicely. Um, if you have friends that um, can help you, can read your essay, I, I had a couple of friends also read my essay and, and they were like, oh, maybe you should change this. This sort of comes across like, uh, it comes across a little fake or something like that. So because your friends know you. Um, so have somebody else read it because you're probably so tired of reading your own personal statement that you, you just don't want to even look no. at it anymore. So um, I had other people read it and edit it. Um, same with my CV. Like I had other people read it, uh, my friends read it and they sort of went through it with a fine toothed comb. Of course, I bought them coffee later, but um, mm -hmm. That really helped out having other people look at critique it very honestly and let me know what was missing and what I could improve on. Yeah, so that should really help. And uh, for personal statement, actually, I have one more question. Uh, so uh, I'm not saying my profile is hundred percent, but like I do have like a couple of weakness, which I'm aware of it. So like, is there any way that you know? I mean. Uh, I'm just asking for your opinion that do you think that I should mention it? Uh, because I did ask a few people, some people said you should just write about your story and what really happened and how you overcame it. And not, I mean, nothing right about your professional uh, journey. And uh, some people said you should not mention your negative things at all, but I kind of don't agree with it. So, I mean, what do you think? Like, should I actually mention the reason why it happened? Or if I can just mention that, okay, I have had this type of setbacks, but I was persistent to, you know, continue my journey. So if, if any, any guidance that or any opinion you have on that? So you kind of answered it yourself. You you said that you know um, I should maybe I think that you're you you think that you should not do that what your other people are telling you right because yes you should mention some of the things that happened because you cannot explain that in your CV why you got this grade right so you can kind of like back it up with your story and. And yeah, you can really do that, but you don't want to justify and justify, oh, this happened and this happened. And, you know, like you keep going, then it kind of comes across like really <laughs> weird. You don't want to do that, but just, just write from your heart, like this happened and how I, you know, came back stronger and I'm now doing this. So, you know, things like that you can do. Okay. And, and in my personal statement was like a story, to be honest, it was just like, I'm there, I'm writing a book about what happened uh, as I went through my journey. It was not about, I went to dental school, I did this, I like this, I like oral surgery, I like ortho, no, you don't wanna do that. I, you know, it's, it was just like flowing like a story and how I started, um, you know, being the only dentist in my family to, you know, coming to us and then you know still pers I want to pursue my dream I don't want to like you know give up on it so I kind of like wrote a story on it and how I had some moments in my you know in between when I was doing dental school there were moments that you know um, were really rewarding and that kind of like um, boosted my you know dream of being a dentist even more and more so that was like a story I wrote and um, you guys can you know feel free to do something like that you don't have to be very robotic about it so that's one of my advices yeah for sure and I hope I answered your question as well yes you did thank you thank you Shita you want to add to that I was gonna say exactly that that I wouldn't make my my whole personal statement about that because I, I actually did mention a couple of uh, weaknesses that I had in my CV and I sort of explained it in my statement and I said hey see I came out of it so um, yeah. 
but I made it one small part of it. Um, it was just a part of my story because it doesn't make me who I am. It's, it's just a part of who I am, so. Okay, hi, my name is Valeria. Um, I first, I want to thank you, thank you for this. Uh, this is very helpful and you cover almost all what I want to ask. <laughs> and um, I just have um, more questions about the CV. Like, I feel like my CV has nothing. I mean, I just, I graduate and then the moment I graduate, I move to the US and I start working as a dental assistant and I think that's it. And I have a lot of experience in my country as a volunteering, but since COVID, because I have um, two years in the US. So um, since COVID, there's not much to volunteer. And I know this harbor because I'm located in San Diego. So I know harbor is gonna be the November 17th. So I already registered to volunteer over there. So great. I'm and but I don't know what else to do like I feel like I don't know like um because I don't have much and I don't have experience like working in my own country neither so yes you have any advice besides all you, what you already said so I think um most schools would understand that point that after COVID you don't have a lot of opportunities out there right but I would say that if you're here only for two years right? That's what you mentioned. <clears throat> and yeah. you are working as a dental assistant and you are trying to achieve more. Um, uh, it's good. You're still doing something, right? You are trying to, you know, move your hands and feet. Um, but don't be worried if you're feeling like, oh, I don't have enough. Or if you have volunteering experience from your country, that is also very good. You can still mention that, okay? Because obviously, you haven't been here for that long, so it's fine. Um, but yeah, if you are going to be going to that harbor care care harbor, it's excellent. It's gonna really look good on your resume. Um, and if you could do some more CE courses, um, that would also help, I think. And then Ishita cannot do that. Yeah, and if you don't have a lot of number of uh, experiences, you can make, you can sort of uh, focus on the quality of that experience. So suppose Care Harbor, so you can write two bullet points with the Care Harbor about what you did. And also uh, not just like a robotic representation of the responsibilities, but you can say that, oh, I um, uh, did fluoride sealant for hundred plus people or something like that. That's just an example, but you can write bullet points of what you did for that event or um, even for your assisting, you can write, sort of beef up your, that one bullet point, you can write four bullet points that this is how I made my dentist's life better by assisting. So you can also write that. Uh, that's how I um, lengthened my resume a lot because I wrote like four or five bullet points in every experience that this is how uh, my company benefited from my role and responsibility. So write it in bullet points. That will really fill up that, Junk. So even if you don't have a lot of quantity, you can fill uh, bullet points in the ones that you have had to highlight your experience. And do you know any other like organizations I can uh, volunteer here, like in California, like not too far because I'm in San Diego. So I, the, the farthest I can go is LA because I'm also working as a general assistant right now. So, mm -hmm. so if you have, you know, any organization because I have research in Google, like and nothing pops up. And I don't know how even I found this Harvard thing, but I did. <laughs> I think American Red Cross, I was also a blood donor ambassador. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, so I used to do that like every other weekend or so that because I was working full time too. Um, so it was very hard for me to do anything on the weekday, but I, I used to go to American Red Cross centers every other weekend or so. So maybe search for them because they're, I know they're always looking for volunteers um, because they're a volunteer run organization, right? Um, and what else? But I think in San Diego, there's a couple of people from in our batch from San Diego and they all volunteered at UCSD. I'm not sure of the after COVID how much they allow, um, but uh, sometimes, sometimes the schools have volunteering opportunities. Yeah, I look for that and they say that they are accepting like applications, but right now it's like closed. So mm -hmm. they will, when, yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah, I know. If I, if you guys don't mind me chiming in a little bit, of course. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, great presentation, by the way. Super informative. Um, yeah, Jackie and I both <clears throat> both graduated from UCSD, oh, and we were yeah. involved with the uh, Pre Dental Society, and they have um, actually student run free dental clinics, so providing free care, all volunteers, both on part with the with the dentists and providers that come in, as well as those who manage the clinic and assist, uh, take X rays, and so. I, I know that they're they're up and running and um yeah you can go online and just type in oh jackie is already <laughs> we're on the same wavelength mm -hmm. um yeah yeah, so, yeah that that was super helpful for us um and myself personally just getting to get more involvement um through volunteering and i know i, I do know some some people in the ucla dental school who as well were ppid mm -hmm. um and volunteered with me. So that was pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for adding that. Any other questions? Yeah, Ashita and Amna are the two advanced standing committee chairs within our UCLA ASDA chapter, and they are just such an amazing resource. I was so impressed by this presentation. Oh, did you have one more question? When you just... No, no, sorry. I, oh. I was just uh, trying to say thank you for, uh, you know, arranging this because I am uh, following you on Instagram and then, you know, I also attended like the pre-dental uh, day that you have in, you know, the series that you're arranging. And uh, so I know like this is the first uh, PPID uh, series, but I mean, if you can do something more for uh, students like us, that would be really helpful. And thank you to both of you for, you know, giving out your valuable time on like evening. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm thrilled that so many of you were able to join us for the live session. And I think I'm even more thrilled that we'll be able to have this as a saved resource on our YouTube, just because it was so comprehensive and informative. Um, yeah, but we always get PPID questions and Ethan and I <laughs> don't, always, don't always know what to do. So I'm thrilled that our platform has been able to expand a little bit wider to incorporate some aspiring PPID students. So yeah, I see you guys put your emails in the chat, awesome. And then the next lectures within our series will be on November 17th. It'll be the dental school experience panel. So there'll be a D1 through D4. It'll be more focused on the DDS program, but I think that is an opportunity to get to know the culture at UCLA School of Dentistry in general. So I would encourage you guys to join that as well. I think we have your emails on file so we can send that link as well. And yeah, does anyone have any final remarks? Any last minute questions? All right, well, thank you all for joining us. This, is, this has been a pleasure to start off our first fall lecture series with you all. And I guess we'll see you next time. Thank you, Jackie and Ethan, for hosting it. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. That oh, was no, thank so you wonderful. Guys. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Have a good night, okay. everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.